Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I am uh, Dr. Scott Schultz of the um, Kielty Center. I'm the medical director, and that's at uh, Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, Maryland. We're pleased to have case managers who treat individuals with spina bifida present today or participating via live webcast uh, to learn about the prevention and treatment of secondary conditions from our multidisciplinary team here at the Kielty Center. Um, this morning's seminar is being videotaped and a DVD is going to be produced. And if you are interested in ordering the DVD, you can complete the order form in your seminar packet. So I'm the first speaker today and I'm going to give you an overview of spina bifida and some of the secondary conditions. So spina bifida is part of a group of birth defects called neural tube defects. Uh, and the neural tube is the embryonic structure that eventually develops them into the brain and the cord and the tissues that enclose them. And normally this tube forms very early during the pregnancy, uh, typically in the first uh, th four weeks of uh, pregnancy. And in spina bifida, a portion of that tube fails to develop or close properly. Spina bifida is the second most common cause of, PD of, of childhood disability following cerebral palsy. It is the most common spinal cord pathology in children. Um, and the National Spina Bifida Association documents more than 70,000 individuals in the U.S. with spina bifida and approximately 3,000 pregnancies each year in the U.S. per the CDC. The highest incidence has been noted among women of Hispanic ethnicity. Increased incidence has also been noted in maternal diabetes, low socioeconomic status, higher rate in children born in the early winter months or a mid-spring conception, maternal obesity, in utero exposure to drugs like Depakote or valproic acid, and maternal febrile illness within the first month of pregnancy. Um, it's also been noticed to have higher incidence in women who use hot tubs or saunas in the first month. Um, so at one point, folic acid wasn't being fortified in grains, but now it, that it is, there is less of an incidence of spina bifida. Um, but um, because of medical technology, people are living longer with, with spina bifida. Um, and folic acid peri conceptually and during early pregnancy helps reduce the risk of neural tube defects. And we recommend any woman considering becoming pregnant take 0.4 milligrams of folic acid daily and women who are pregnant one milligram daily. And if you're a person um, with spina bifida who is pregnant or if you have given birth to a previous child with spina bifida, if you're taking anti-seizure medications like valproic acid, or if you have um, di or maternal diabetes, then we usually recommend four milligrams, so 10 times the normal dose, beginning one month prior to conception and during the first few months of pregnancy. Um, so during pregnancy, prenatal screening can help diagnose the condition. Um, what we look for is an elevated maternal um, alpha fetoprotein or AFP level. And you would check this during the second trimester um, when you check something called the quadruple screen, which looks for diseases such as Down syndrome, spina bifida, um, and other types of, um, Ill of diseases. Um, if that's elevated um, AFP level it occurs, then we would undergo a pregnancy ultrasound. And you may see splaying of the pedicles and the classic lemon and banana sign. And the lemon is what the head is described in, in its shape. And the banana sign is the herniation of the cerebellar vermis um, through the frame and magnum. Um, one could also undergo an amniocentesis. And all this can be done around 16 weeks. You know, when you read, some will say 12 to 13, some will say 14 to 16. So just approximately the 16 week is when all of this kind of will occur in the screening process. So there are different types of spina bifida. There's a culta, which the problem is the vertebrae, or the bo it's a bony defect. Otherwise, the spinal cord, the meninges, all other elements are intact. It usually affects the L5, S1, lumbar 5, sacral 1 levels. Um, typically, there's no neurologic issues at birth, so they're moving all their legs, moving all their extremities. Um, they don't have hydrocephalus or Chiari malformation, which is associated with another type of spina bifida. But as they develop, especially when they go through growing spurts, um, you need to counsel them about potential tethered cord in the future. And tethered cord is an abnormal attachment of the um, spinal cord at its distal end and can manifest as spasticity, um, severely worsening scoliosis, um, changes in bowel or bladder. So that all needs to be counseled with spina bifida occulta. Spina, uh, bifida, spina bifida cystica, the spinal canal contents herniate. In meningocele, the meninges is affected, and you're typically normal neurologically because the cord isn't affected. In myelomeningocele, which is the most common type of spina bifida, the meninges and the spinal cord are affected. And in this type, you get the Arnold Chiari or Chiari 2 malformation, which can affect breathing um, or 
uh, sleeping or swallowing. Um, and you also get hydrocephalus or water in the brain, which can manifest as headaches, nausea, vomit. Um, you also get neurologic deficits, with, including paraplegia or weakness in the extremities, neurogenic bowel and neurogenic bladder. So you can't um, use the bathroom on your own. You need assistive devices to help, whether it's suppositories or catheterization. Sensory loss, so you've got to examine your skin make, and maintain your skin integrity. Keep an eye on it. And this typically occurs 75% in the lumbosacral segment. A third type is caudal regression syndrome, and there's absence of the sacrum and portions of the lumbar spine. Other findings with um, caudal regression syndrome include anorectal stenosis, renal abnormalities, sometimes one kidney or a horseshoe kidney. Um, it also can affect the uh, uh, ureters, cardiac problems, and external genital abnormalities. And this one is most commonly associated with maternal diabetes. So um, spina bifida is literally a disease that can affect you from head to toe. So you, there are a lot of um, secondary um, issues that we try to um, prevent or counsel on. Um, some of them are neurologic. So the Chiari 2 malformation or the Arnold Chiari, which is downward displacement of the medulla and a brainstem through the foramen magnum with associated brainstem kinking, can cause some of those uh, sleep issues. So you can get obstructive sleep apnea if that's becoming an issue. Um, dysphagia or difficulty swallowing, we typically think may be a Chiari problem, and you may have to be referred to a neurosurgeon for decompression of that Chiari. Um, hydrocephalus, if significant headaches, a change in the head circumference, like a significantly increased um, size from one clinic visit to the next, um, but excessive vomiting, irritability, lethargy, those are signs of hydrocephalus, so you may need a shunt, or at least to see a neurosurgeon to determine if the shunt is either being obstructed or infected or not working properly. Tethered cord, which I already described as the abnormal attachment of the distal cord. Uh, and with that, you may see um, rapidly progressive scoliosis, um, worsening weakness, changes in bowel or bladder. For that, you'd also refer them to a neurosurgeon to have them image the uh, spine to see if that's the problem. In a syrinx, that also affects the spine. Typically, you see ascending abnormalities. So if you have lumbar, um, spina bifida and affects your legs all of a sudden if you start developing arm weakness or changes in sensation in the arms or weakness there. It could be a syrinx for which you need to see a neurosurgeon as well. It's also known as syringomyelia. Impaired fine motor skills, ataxia, neurogenic bowel and bladder which uh, Susan will be talking about later. From a neuropsychology standpoint or how kind of the brain works in conjunction with other parts of the brain, there are problems with cognition, attention, memory, concentration, executive functioning, and motor planning. From an orthopedic perspective, we, we worry about Charcot joints due to lack of sensation. Um, so that's why we really always want you to keep checking the skin for pressure sores and for Charcot joints. Uh, scoliosis or kyphosis subluxation of the hips, and with hip subluxation, this typically will occur at the level of L3 or below, because the L3, um, at the L3 level, the hip flexors are innervated, and the hip adductors are innervated, but the hip extensors and the hip um, abductors are not innervated at that level. So you have an abnormality or an alteration in joint forces, which can cause the, the hips to dislocate. If one hip is dislocated, we're concerned about positioning and pelvic obliquity, and we would recommend that that be operated on. If you have bilaterally subluxed hips, typically orthopedics will not operate because um, it typically does not significantly change the gait pattern and the risks of surgery um, outweigh the benefits if it's bilateral. And uh, for individuals who are paraplegic and they're in a wheelchair, they get a lot of hip flexion and knee flexion contractures. So you really got to make sure that they stretch those on a daily basis. Um, for the hips, we recommend prone positioning. So that's lying on your stomach. That helps stretch out those hip flexors for at least 30 minutes a day. Um, and with knee flexion contractures, um, we recommend um, strengthening those, trying to strengthen those quads and doing some um, hamstring stretches for at least 30 minutes a day. Um, from an eye standpoint, um, you may have issues with strabismus or nystagmus for which they would see an ophthalmologist. From a renal standpoint, any area in the kidneys or the ureters can have a malformation, um, and so a urologist is really important in an individual with spina bifida's care. Um, because of decreased energy expenditure, a lot of um, the patients are obese, unfortunately, uh, which re predisposes you to having even more pressure sores and a lot more difficulty with transfers, um, with cathings. So we really recommend 10 to 20% decrease in 
caloric intake typically in this population um, with frequent weight checks as well, as well as an aerobic program using arm ergometry. Just get, they really need the exercise. Um, this typically is a lower motor neuron disorder, so as opposed to an upper motor neuron disorder like cerebral palsy. And in that type of um, injury with upper motor neuron disorder, you're in a more hypermetabolic state because of um, the spasticity. So they require more calories sometimes. This is a lower motor neuron disorder, so you would need less calories. And then pressure sores. So you really need to check the skin and do wheelchair push-ups. So we typically recommend for wheelchair push-ups um, every 15 minutes for 15 seconds, 30 minutes for 30 seconds, one hour, 60 seconds. Um, any area can get affected. If you're in your wheelchair all day and you have a headrest, you can get an ox occiput pressure sore. Um, you can get scapular pressure sores. You can get ischial or sacral or kind of buttock pressure sores. You can get on the side of your hip trochanteric pressure sores. You can get foot sores. So you got to check the whole body from head to toe. Other issues um, in spina bifida include latex allergy and precautions. The prevalence of latex sensitivity has been reported as high as 72% in the spina bifida population. And there's something known as the latex fruit syndrome. So um, there's cross-reactivity among banana, avocado, kiwi, and chestnut with latex, as well as papaya, mango, bell pepper, fig, tomato, celery, and potato. So we counsel our new parents about these allergies or these things to maybe look for if there's an allergic reaction. Some undergo um, radio allergosorbent testing or RAS testing through an allergy immunologist. Um, and as I said, it is important to educate patients and families on the cross-reactivity between latex and these type of foods. Another concern is precocious puberty. Um, and this, you can develop marked short stature if untreated. This results from abnormalities of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, a Chiari 2 malformation, and hydrocephalus, and it causes premature pulsatile secretion of gonadotropin-releasing hormones. Um, one of the screening labs that you could check is a luteinizing hormone, or an LH, which would be elevated, and we treat this with a growth hormone. Another concern is osteoporosis. Uh, children with spina bifida have a higher fracture risk. And femurs, uh, fractures typically occur in the long bones of the lower extremity, such as the femur, and then less often the tibia. Um, at around five years of age, we will recommend obtainment of a DEXA scan. Um, and the treatment, and this is from the American Academy of Pediatrics for osteoporosis, between ages one to three is calcium 500 milligrams daily, from ages four to eight, 800 milligrams daily, and from nine to 18, 1300 milligrams daily with a minimum intake of 400 international units of vitamin D daily, and we typically prescribe one to 2,000 international units a day in our clinic. And if you've, if you've had a fracture, then we would consider sending you to an endocrinologist for bisphosphonate treatment like IV pimidronate. Um, so as I said, less kids because of the fortification of grain are being born, but people are living longer because of medical technology. And uh, adults with spina bifida are satisfied with life, but are concerned about self-care ability and partner relationships. Um, spinal deformities can also cause back pain. Um, if they're in wheelchairs, they are now using their arms to do all the work, so they can get shoulder syndromes or carpal tunnel syndrome, um, rotator cuff pathology, which is common in wheelchair and crutch users. Um, gastric motility decreases with age, so you may have to um, change the bowel program. It may need to be tweaked a little. Um, aging also causes changes in fat and muscle distribution, making one more prone to pressure sores, so continuing to check skin integrity throughout your lifetime. And as I talked about, it's, um, in spina bifida, obesity is, is common, and so metabolic syndrome is more common in obesity, um, and that places them at risk for coronary artery disease, hypertension, and diabetes. Um, sexuality and sexual function are also affected in spina bifida. Um, Viagra has been um, shown to improve erectile function in 80% of men. Um, but fertility is impaired in men. Only about 14% of men report fathering children. Um, women, on the other hand, have normal menstruation and are able to conceive and have children. Um, their fertility is not impaired, but their frequency of premature labor is increased. So sexual counseling is important. So when um, we see a child in the um, neonatal ICU with spina bifida, typically they will see a neurosurgeon for closure of spinal contents, and that's the spina bifida, typically uh, the cystica, not the occulta, as I said, which shows up more as a patch. Um, with the cystica, they'll close up those spinal contents, and you may need a, a VP shunt because of that hydrocephalus that I talked about before. And then based on concerns, referrals will be placed to urology, orthopedics, endocrinology, ophthalmology. 
Um, so Susan's going to talk more about neurogenic bowel and bladder, but um, just some basic things that we educate on is uh, CIC or um, intermittent catheterization. Um, and that's helped help get rid of the urine from your body. They can't get rid of it on their own, so they need a method in order to re release that urine. So typically we recommend cathing, you know, five, six times a day. Um, if they're leaking, they may need anticholinergics like Ditropan to increase the bladder capacity. And we recommend routine renal ultrasounds, as well as uh, VCUG and neurodynamics. Um, from a neurogenic bowel standpoint, um, we recommend having consistent timed programs. Um, typically, every night after dinner, using the gastrocolic reflex. And what that reflex, and that's inherent in everyone, is that after you eat, you want to use the bathroom. You want to have a bowel movement. So after you have dinner, 30 to 60 minutes later, we recommend going on the toilet, maybe using a suppository, and, and just sticking with that program and be consistent with it. Um, we typically recommend a high fiber diet, um, and, but they may need, as I said, Miralax, suppositories, enemas um, to, to have a good bowel program. Um, therapies um, include physical therapy to assess for mobility, transverse, means of ambulation, such as the parapodium, RGO, or reciprocal gait orthoses, AFOs, range of motion to all joints below the level of paralysis, caregiver training, energy conservation techniques, fall prevention and recovery strategies. So physical therapy is really involved and very important in, in this patient population. From an occupational therapy perspective to assess ADLs, activities of daily living and cathing skills. As I said, sometimes there's impaired fine motor control, so that's something that OT will work on. From a speech therapy and neuropsychological perspective, um, patients with spina bifida, as I had already mentioned, and which Dr. Andy Zabel is going to mention later, um, is that there's decreased concentration, attention, focus. Um, this patient population has um, has very good verbal ability. So um, they term the phrase cocktail party personality. So it's the speech pattern of repeating phrases, using common phrases, talking about unrelated topics. And that creates the impression of a higher intellectual function to the untrained person. Um, and then when you formally test them, the outcomes are much different. Um, so when we're consulted by the NICU, um, we recommend a renal ultrasound and a VCUG, avoiding cystourethrogram at birth and neurodynamics within the first six weeks of life, an MRI within one year of life of the brain and spine, um, SNP array or genetics as thought needed, renal ultrasound every three months in the first year of life, um, we typically would only repeat the VCUG if there's evidence of reflux or recurrent infections. Regarding catheterization, it kind of depends at birth. Um, if the ultrasound is normal, we may recommend once a day cathing just to make sure it's all getting it coming out. Um, but that's something that we'll definitely keep a, a lookout for, and that's why we get, get such frequent renal ultrasounds. And we also recommend amoxicillin 25 milligrams per kilogram per day for the first six months to prevent infections. So. Here's just uh, two questions I have for you guys. So a 10-year-old child with L4, 5, myelodysplasia and shunted hydrocephalus develops spasticity or increased tone in the legs. The most likely cause of the spasticity is A, shunt malfunction, B, symptomatic Chiari malformation, C, normal growth, D, tethered cord. And what is the answer to that? That's correct, tethered cord. It's the most common cause of new onset spasticity in patients with uh, spina bifida. Linear growth does not cause new spasticity. As I talked about with the QR malformation, they include cranial nerve disorders, dysphagia, respiratory problems, sleep issues, and shunt malfunction may be associated with headaches, vomiting or emesis, eye muscle abnormalities, and sometimes abdominal pain. So children with which physical disorder tend to have higher verbal skills compared to overall cognitive ability? Children with muscular dystrophy, myelodysplasia, cerebral palsy, or autism? The answer is um, B, myelodysplasia. So children with myelodysplasia or spina bifida have deceptively good verbal facility that creates the impression of higher intellectual functioning than is found on formal testing. And I, we talked about that as the cocktail party personality or, per, or syndrome. Children with cerebral palsy, autism, and muscular dystrophy do not typically demonstrate this good verbal, um, um, these good verbal skills with a significant change in formal testing. And I wanted to give a special thanks to everyone involved in today's presentation, including Elena Bradley, Jennifer Brown, um, our, that's our, our nurse for the clinic, Charles Curry, who's our, one of our administrators for the clinic, Susan Demetridis, who typically sees the children in our clinic, um, Leslie Frank, who um, is an occupational therapist who works on our child's uh, seating needs, Tony Schumate, who organized this uh, presentation and lecture series today, 
Terry Zachar Chemney, our OT in the clinic, who's been there for about seven years, and Dr. Andrew Zabel, our neuropsychologist for the, uh, for the clinic. And that's my part of the presentation. Thank you guys very much. Sure. Do you have a question? Um, yes. Okay. So, in your experience, more recently, I guess, than, than in the past, um, what kind of results are you seeing in the children that have had intrauterine surgery versus those who have not? So that is, so yeah, so some, of the, some um, new t evidence has come out about the intrauterine technology, but we have not seen too many kids who have had that, un have had that surgery yet. Have, have you seen too many? Yeah. Just a few, but not many. So we haven't really been able to see the long-term effects of how well it's going to end up turning out. But that's something we're definitely interested in researching and looking into. I'm working with a patient now mm -hmm. who had surgery at 24 weeks old, and he looks great. Well, that's uh, good, so yeah. No, we don't have, we have a few patients, um, but we haven't had a huge population to really study them well yet, but it certainly is promising, and it's something that we're excited about, so. Yeah, let me see, I have to introduce you. And the next person who's going to be talking is Susan Dimitridis. She's our nurse practitioner with the Kielty Center, who typically sees our 21 and younger, and she specializes in continence issues and uh, pressure sore skin management. Are all of you case managers? OT. OT, OK, good. Um, and those of you that are case managers, are you social work or nursing backgrounds? Both nursing. Uh, social work. OK, so it, it's a variety. I'll try to um, uh, hit both areas. So as Dr. Schultz told you that spina, or showed, spina bifida is extraordinarily complex condition and we have seen significant progress over the years. Um, we've, the neurosurgical interventions have improved morbidity or mortality and as the one participant just uh, asked about prenatal di uh, uh, diagnosis and actual surgery um, has some promising um, Effect, uh, potential, that, but the data is not all in. The mom study is still gathering a huge amount of data. And when I was at the SBA a conference, um, there's certainly some positive correlation with um, ambulation, but we still don't know the long term cognitive and bowel and bladder input I effects on this. But um, we will probably, you know, as this generation of children grow, we'll, we'll find, find out. So um, you have the neurosurgical interventions. You have the the uh, great advances in orthopedics, the therapies, and um, orthotics or bracing that are also improving functional outcome in children with spina bifida. But bowel and bladder management throughout the lifetime uh, lifespan remains an extraordinarily complicated and frustrating problem for our families. So I am, in our limited time, are going to just, just give you an overview of neurogenic bladder and then discuss the uh, strategies as well as neurogenic bowel and current management practices. To understand a nor, um, neurogenic bladder, you really need to understand what a normal bladder functioning is. So normal bladder functioning allows the bladder to fill with little, little or no contractions or squeezing and change of pressure. It should be a relaxing, a relaxed bladder. If you think of a balloon, that just fills. It has phases. Um, it's more complicated than this, but for our purposes, storage phase and voiding phase. Um, during the voiding phase, there um, is a continuous uh, contraction of the detrusor muscle, which is the bladder muscle, and there's also relaxation of sphincter, the bladder, uh, the sphincter in the bladder neck, which leads to complete bladder emptying. Your slides aren't all going to include. I've added some more things. Um, the also. Uh, also to add to this, this all occurs within a normal time span. 
So um, that means you go, you eliminate, and you're done. You don't continue to dribble, or you don't have hesitancy under normal con conditions and void and stop and void again. The storage phase works when you have normal bladder sensation, therefore you feel when you're ready, when your bladder's full and ready to eliminate. You have um, normal detrusor activity, that is the bladder muscles not contracting, and you have bladder compliance and bladder capacity, so your bladder is allowed to fill, um, and bladder capacity um, to the, is to, your bladder is allowed to fill to the normal capacity for your age. So generally an infant or newborn will have a bladder capacity of 30 cc's, where an adult would be 30, not 390 or above. So what happens in a neurogenic bladder? You have impairments in all those areas, storage and voiding. Um, a neurogenic bladder is a condition that affects the lower urinary tract function secondary to neural injury. This is different from um, avoiding dysfunction that a lot of children experience. So this is due to an actual organic problem. The one thing that I have to stress here is that neurogenic bladder is not a static condition. Rather, it changes over time. So um, if you're wondering why are they have they just had this test, why are they having this test? I'll explain, but basically it's because we are, we are monitoring that lower urinary tract. So spina bifida directly doesn't affect kidneys, it affects which are the upper tract. Initially it affects the lower urinary tract or your bladder. If we don't monitor that, then we have later changes in the kidney. So our management goals are to preserve the renal or kidney function, prevent infection, and eventually when the child is developmentally ready, develop social continence. Uh, management includes ongoing surveillance throughout the lifespan. Most people rely on clean intermittent catheterization, while well, I'll discuss further. Medication and surgery may be used. Uh, terms you'll see in reports or that you um, might wonder what they mean are you might have uh, reports saying the child has a low pressure bladder versus a high pressure bladder. A low pressure bladder is annoying when you um, try to in initiate bladder training or potty training because urine is often dribbling and it's hard to, the store, there's a, often a problem with storage there. But a high pressure bladder is the one we really worry about because that's the one that's going to affect damage, um, kidney, kidney functioning if not treated early. And all those children with high pressure bladders um, usually require clean intermittent catheterization. You'll see the word sphincter dyssynergia, and that's, remember when I talked about normal bladder functioning, the normal bladder relaxes as it fills the um, sphincter in the bladder neck closes, preventing leaking. What happens, and then when you void, you, your bladder muscle contracts and the uh, bladder neck relaxes. This, um, in dysynergia, they're both contracting at the same time, causing urine to back up towards the kidneys. Hydronephrosis will be, you'll see on an ultrasound report, and that's always where I sim, it indicates some kind of swelling in the kidneys. And those individuals need further management by their urologist, and almost all of those children are on um, clean intermittent catheterization. Uh, high residuals or residuals or incomplete emptying is another problem with someone with a neurogenic bladder, and um, reflux is a very serious problem. And those children um, that have uh, reflux are experiencing retrograde flow of urine from the bladder to the kidneys. And um, there's actually um, a, a national committee now redefining it, but that, that um, report won't be out till June. But basically we do know that uh, reflux in areas of three to five are associated with kidney damage. So we do want to take care of those. So how do you? So, so, so um, surveillance is our main intervention. We really need to keep an eye on those kidneys. So what are we going to do? We're going to um, do ultrasounds, 
urodynamics, also called UDS, VCU, renal, and DMSA, which is um, renal scan imaging at times. We monitor those children's height and weights. So if, um, most children with spina bifida are, are shorter than their counterparts, but if we see their um, height starting to uh, level off, then we start worrying about other um, organic problems. Blood pressures that are slightly creeping up. I mean, infants or, or toddlers shouldn't have a systolic blood pressure of 120. So we really want to make sure that we know we have developmentally appropriate norms um, for our children's blood pressure. And there's specific laboratory work we do to monitor. So when the insurance companies ask us why we're doing these things, we actually have um, real, real reasons to do it. We, and then I'll talk more about preventing kidney damage and attaining continence. So this isn't a great picture, but it's so old because they don't do it that much anymore. It's a urinary, urinary diversion where the um, ureters are, um, are rerouted to, through the uh, abdominal wall and um, the bladder is no longer functional. This was done in the 50s, 60s, and all the way through the 70s as a routine management of someone's spina bifida. So some of your adults may still have a, a, um, a appliance. This is different than a continent urinary stoma that does not require an appliance. But this was um, a, the treatment versus, or diapers. That was your only choice. And then we came. Um, then we um, came into the 70s and there were other interventions. And interventions today now depend on some of the findings we do during our surveillance. So um, let me start first on the surveillance and then I'll go back into the current man um, management. So surveillance includes the renal and bladder ultrasound pre and post void. We want that post void. Um, ultrasound first to see if that person's emptying their bladder appropriately and also if they are um, cathing, if they're doing a good job cathing, we want to see that. Um, uh, we, the renal and bladder ultrasound really just assesses the uh, kidney, fun uh, kidney anatomy and the bladder anatomy. It does not tell us about reflux, it can't diagnose reflux, it can't diagnose function, it can't tell us that. But it can tell us if there's hydronephrosis and those ureters are a little swell swollen or the kidneys are a little swollen that may indicate the patient might have reflux or some other problems. It can also tell us if they have um, stones and need further evaluation. So that's the main purpose. Timing of the renal and bladder ultrasound varies from institution, Hopkins and us. Um, we, all, all newborns get a renal and bladder ultrasound, and then um, every three to six months um, in the first year, generally six months unless there's a concern, then we'll do it sooner. And then thereafter, um, later, later childhood, we'll do once a year unless there's a problem. And that's the most frequent. It's also the cheapest, it's not invasive. Then the VCUG is the one test that can tell us about reflux. Um, uh, just an addendum to that, they do have urodynamics with video. That can tell us about reflux, but it has to have video. So really, I'm, Hopkins doesn't have a video uh, urodynamics. I don't think Maryland does. So very few place, places do. More of them are getting them. But if you um, just have a regular urodynamics and your only way to assess reflux is through the VCU, previously called VCUG. Um, and the timing of these, we all newborns get it to look and see if they have reflux. And then periodically if the child has recurrent urinary tract infections of unknown etiology, if um, there's problems with um, changes in bladder functioning, um, they might uh, look to see if there's reflux. The urodynamic studies, or UDS, um, have become the uh, gold standard for um, assessing bladder functioning. That's the only thing that's going to tell us what the bladder's doing. And there's a lot of controversy uh, when and where to use it. We have urodynamics done the first year of life. And then thereafter, uh, our urologists, some 
recommend yearly. Others recommend every few years. It really depends on the urologist. But um, you definitely want to obtain a urodynamics if there's a question of tether cord. You don't want anybody to operate on your cord unless you have a baseline urodynamics to see what's going on. Um, so it, it looks at both the fa filling and emptying phase as a bladder function. It can tell you pressures, and there's a number of different pressures they'll give to you, but for our purposes, I'm most, important in, uh, most interested in the leak point pressure, which is the pressure um, after that, that first leak or void um, when the bladder um, is filled. And that pressure over 40 is going to give, is, is going to tell you that you have some um, hostile environment in your bladder and you need to treat it. So under 40 you're safe, but a leak point pressure of 40 or more is a problem, more than 40. Um, it tells us about compliance. So if you think of compliance as um, a, a, a low compliant bladder is a bladder in a, or a balloon, in a, like filling a balloon in a box. You can't get very, very far. It's stiff. And um, that talks about bladder functioning, and that can contribute to high pressures also. It can help us, uh, your dynamics can help us figure out why the person's leaking. Like if you, if you have no tone in your bladder neck and a small bladder capacity, all the cathing in the world by itself is not going to get you continent. So again, it helps us direct tr treatment. And it looks at the ability to, to empty the bladder. And I already said it's the first year of life and thereafter as needed. Um, renal scanning is also known as DMSA. And that's not a routine test. But that is a test that you're going to get, uh, see, obtained. Um, it looks at renal scarring and renal functioning. And it's going to be a test you're going to order that is going to be ordered if uh, the child's had recurrent febrile urinary tract infections, and um, especially pyelonephritis, to see what is going on in those kidneys. And um, again, it's mainly a response to recurrent urinary tract infections or change in a child with increased blood pressure, other things that may indicate changes in kidney functioning. Their labs that, and again, these vary between centers. Our center does a yearly meta, um, complete metabolic, and creatinine's, creatinine is a very rough, you know, it's, it's not a great uh, way to follow. It, it, it'll, high creatinines will tell you that you have renal problems, but um, you don't want to get there. What we've found is some kids were getting um, into renal trouble with normal creatinines, but if you looked at their creatinines, they were creeping up within the range of normal. So that's why we do the yearly metabolic um, studies, because we can monitor, and if there's um, some tendency to be going up, then we'll, um, it, we'll evaluate further. There's also the Cysat, Stat, and C, which isn't used widely, but more people are using, and it seems to be more sensitive um, than the, the creatinine um, in looking at, or, or as sensitive, but uh, may actually pick up changes faster. Uh, urine, urine tests include urinalysis and culture, and I don't know, there is, even in a pediatrician's office, there's no reason to do a bagged urine culture ever, and especially with a child's spina bifida. All, as a t uh, they, they need to be cast. If you're going to get a culture, you cast, and um, that's, there's no, the, the, that's the standard. Um, you, um, in a person that is typically catheterizes, you always get a urinalysis because their bladders are going to be colonized. They're going to have bacteria. So you may be getting their normal flora or their colonized urine and not a urinary tract infection if you get a urine without getting a urinalysis. And we tend to only do urines. We don't do routine urines. We only get a urine when the child has symptoms. So what do we, we have all the surveillance. What do we do to manage? Um, so Lapid has really changed the practice of um, care with people with spina bifida. And it, has, it, it was a significant change. In the 1970s, he introduced clean intermittent ca catheterization and showed there was no relation, there, there was no change whether you did a sterile cath 
or a proper clean cath. There was no change in the rate of infection. And in fact, what we did see was a drop in infection by intermittently emptying the bladder on a consistent basis. And today, um, the, the, sta the standard of care is clean intermittent catheterization with the majority of people. I did want to, since we were just talking about labs, the, treat the assessment of a urinary tract infection in a person that catheterizes is very different than the UTI assessment in somebody that doesn't get catheterized. So you, and that's where the urinalysis becomes very important. You need, you know, if you, and you have combined with infection, uh, signs and symptoms, you have to have at least three and, um, of four of the following criteria that we use to identify urinary tract infections. Um, so the presence of fever, flank pain, abdominal pain, or change in continence. Some children will just vomit and not feel good. They'll feel lethargic. But it would be a, a, a change in the child's condition more than just cloudy urine. Um, you have, your analysis is important. It, you have to, um, uh, if you only ha have one or two white cells in your urine, you're probably not dealing with a urinary tract infection. You need to look elsewhere. But um, greater than or equal, it should be greater than an e or equal, 25 white blood cells per high power field is, indicates a urinary tract infection, as do nitrites and some other findings on your urinalysis. Um, and of course, a, a bacterial culture of 100,000 per mil of, or greater colonies per mil of, of urine. Um, the symptoms and or persistent change in color or odor of urine. So if I have a child with spina bifida whose mom says, oh, they're playing, they're fine, but their urine this in the morning seems kind of um, strong and, or cloudy, I'll say, well, drink throughout the day and see what happens. And invariably, for the most part, those urines improve. We um, did this because kids were being over-medicated uh, with antibiotics, and that leads to long-term resistance, which is what we don't want to see in children who will need them for surgeries and other problems. So in addition to dealing with renal and blood, uh, maintaining the kidneys, the next thing we want to do when the child is developmentally appropriate is think of continence. And this is a huge um, problem with our families because in the newborn period, you're just dealing with the fact that you have a little baby that has so many serious problems. And um, they, and, and oh, the doctor says we don't have to cath anymore because they have a, a low bladder, low pressure bladder. But you know in the back of your mind, you're probably going to have to revisit this. And, um, and so typical, we sometimes have to remind our families that typical potty training isn't always going to work. And for the most part, we're going to need some aids. And clean intermittent catheterization, as we said, is the major um, intervention. Uh, we can try time to toiling being sitting on the potty every two to three hours, but if, you know, depending on what the urodynamics, and I have one or two children that we've gotten potty trained with time toileting. They have sensation, they, um, and they're able to recognize their own body cues. They can empty completely, and they don't have urinary tract infections. So, but for the vast majority, the, uh, clean intermittent catheterization has, um, since, then, the, since the 1970s, has been very helpful in giving them another choice. It's a process of passing a catheter through the urethra or the, uh, through a catheterizable ch channel. Um, it can be through your belly button, um, which a lot of people have, and um, you can't tell whether, or, or somewhere else in the abdomen. You can wear a swimming suit, you can go swimming. Um, it doesn't affect that. Um, it's just you introduce the catheter from another site. Cathing avoids residuals that can lead to urinary tract infection, and, um, but you don't have the complications that you would with an indwelling catheter. And um, it has the potential to improve continence. What do we, um, one thing I'd like to insert here is that uh, bowel and bladder management really is an interdisciplinary approach. You can, I, I, we, I am so fortunate here to have 
the colleagues I have, um, because our kids are so complex that uh, you, you really need somebody with experts in a number of different, expertise in a number of different fields to help get these children uh, cotton in. And, and with children with spina bifida that hydrocep have hydrocephalus, eye hand coordination and manual dexterity is a huge problem for them. And also for the caregiver, you need to, if you're going to be teaching that person, um, can that person see? I mean, we, we have to rem remember the caregiver first and then eventually the child. Um, the equipment you, you would use is a catheter and afterwards you all pass some of these along, um, around. And they're gender specific in that the uh, males have a longer catheter and they may have a, um, a olive tip, a little tip that's a little different than a straight catheter. Um, to help guide the catheter a little bit better through the penis. Um, they also have different diameters that vary, and, vary, and that inks from a 6 French to a 24 French catheter. Um, some of the catheters are color coded. There are a number of different types, and basically, um, that's patient, um, it, 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 patient preference. So when one washes, in the hospital, of course, we use gloves, but we don't, um, and if we're going to cath, we're probably going to cath to obtain a, a specimen, so we would do a sterile cath. So any of your kids that are getting a urine culture should get cath with a sterile cath. But for the most part, um, either regular cath by the parent or self-cath by the child, um, wash involves these steps. Uh, you all have that in your handout, but um, you don't have to wait till you teach the child how to insert the catheter into their urethra. You um, can start getting that little one washing their hands early on, you know, so they um, they can get that um, those steps done. Appro you know, that, that you can just add different steps as time goes on. Um, when a child's ready, you're looking at their emotional and cognitive re readiness. Very few children have a, um, are, are ready before five. So typical toilet training in, in the United States is about three, given plus or minus a year. In the child with spina bifida, it's going to be about five. Um, you're going to, uh, you also can have a very bright child who is emotional, is cognitively ready, or aware, but is emotionally not ready. So we had uh, a seven or eight year old that had to come in with desensitization with behavior therapy to work because uh, they did. They had such fears related to the procedure. Um, Flashcards can be used to help these children that have problem with sequencing and organization. Um, we have uh, the, all the cath companies. Um, Coloplast has a, a um, video which talks about uh, shows a child. Uh, cathing themselves. Doll playing helps, so having the child have the equipment and play. And um, assistive devices that people use include mirror, make sure you have appropriate back support, toilet seat, um, adequate support for the hips. Um, sometimes um, you really have to ha put the child on the very back of the toilet. Don't sit them right in the middle of the toilet. Um, and they, and uh, you really want something where they, they feel, you know, they, they already have some problems with posture and all, so you don't want them having to, to um, control their body and space while they're trying to cath. Um, there's, co there's controversy in the use of a mirror. The mirror uh, is useful in identifying uh, landmarks, but it can be a problem because of reversal. So I tend to like to teach children by touching, but, um, or lo but um, it does help, especially with girls, um, to use the mirror to initially to indicate landmarks. And let, just to summarize that, mental age of five, understanding the purpose. It's amazing how many kids don't understand why they're cat. Um, memory, spatial awareness, and all, um, other learning problems, and this is where your occupational therapy becomes very important with problems with eye-hand coordination and also seating, helping us with equipment. Um, types of catheters that you'll see ordered. Um, the only 
thing that we demand is that they have to be latex free. And you can see plain, clear PVC catheters with no coating. Um, you have uh, coated catheters, which are real popular in adults and, and um, the spinal, uh, spinal cord population where there's not a lot of eye-hand pro coordination problems, but the slippery catheters, are, uh, catheters I, are tough on kids, especially ones that have sensory problems and um, problems with uh, manip manipulating things. And then there's some catheters that actually come in an integrated bag system too. So there's a whole variety of catheters. And so, um, and these are the various type. You can see that some have the white and the blue. So some are color coded because of their sizes. And the blue is a female catheter. It's short versus the white, which could be female or male. Um, so cathing, when cathing alone isn't enough to indicate um, uh, to attain continence or prevent urinary tract infections, there's uh, medications that can be used um, to increase bladder capacity and decrease pressure. Um, anticholinergics that Dr. Schultz explained, including oxybutynin or ditropan. So ditropan has been the most common because it was the first one that was uh, okay for children, FDA approved for children. There's more and more um, that are coming out, and uh, they, they, uh, they're, they're, they're in different phases of approval. So if ditropan doesn't work, the urologist might try a different type of, anti, a different type of medication. But basically, they're um, associated, they're, they're focused on a, improving bladder capacity or decreasing pressures. Um, there are some kids that will need improved resistance in the bladder neck, so they'll use ephed eph ephedrine. Um, Botox has been used to improve bladder capacity. I know only a couple of children that they've used that um, in Hopkins, and their children that are on their way to a transplant, they just have such high pressures. Medication alone hasn't been able to do it. Um, there's bulking agents for the outlet or bladder neck to help improve resistance and prevent leaking. Um, they, they have variable success. Um, and then there's intrathecal baclofen that's recently been in the research, but I think that needs more study because baclofen itself can cause different problems with the bladder, so. Um, so if you have a small capacity of bladder or you have bladder neck problems, you may eventually, as a teenager or adult, need surgeries. Um, and uh, the one that's most common is the augmentation cystoplasty, and that improves bladder volume and it helps with those high pressure bladders. Uh, they take some, um, general, most of it is taking some bowel and expanding the capacity of the bladder. Uh, they have uh, they they have a good high um, correlation with improved continence. The downside is is you're using bowel and so you have more mucus in your urine and therefore you need to irrigate your bladder more. Um, you have a baby that has a family that just can't catheterize and they have such high pressures they may do a vesicostomy which where the bladder empties, um, the urine just empties uh, onto the, into the bladder wall and the baby just, di there's no appliance, they just diaper the child and then hopefully later on they can reintroduce cathing. Um, bladder neck reconstruction slings, bulking agents, and urinary, uh, artificial urinary sphincters have been explored. I haven't seen much of this with our patients. Um, I, again, with an artificial sphincter, you're going to need somebody that can uh, follow and, and follow a schedule. And so some of the neurocognitive problems interfere with the urologist's selection of a surgery. Uh, and then the continent stoma, which is becoming very popular and allows the individual, especially somebody with uh, orthopedic problems that can't really get down there to cath, um, to 
access their bladder through the abdo abdominal wall. And they have a high success rate. The biggest problem are stenosis or narrowing of the um, uh, channel or a false track where they might perforate the channel. But they're getting better and better at doing these procedures. Uh, developing ther therapies are transurethral, electrical bladder stimulation, tissue engineering, and stem cells. Uh, but they're not, uh, the, the bladder stim is done a lot in people with voiding dysfunction. I, I'm not seeing it here a lot in our area for neurogenic bladder, but some people are doing it. And then I said about bladder irrigation. Anybody that has an augmented bladder, talk to your families. Are they, augment, are they irrigating their bladder because they need to be to get that mucus out? So uh, we can't talk about neurogenic bladder without talking about neurogenic bowel. Um, we know that fewer than 5% of children with myelomeningocele develop voluntary sphincter control, and that's because those, uh, that S2, S4 portion, their abnormality is often in that um, portion that affects sphincter function. Anal rectal sensation can also be impaired, and uh, constipation is usually I would say 90% in an unscientific <laughs> um, summary. My experience is present for most people. Uh, the importance of managing the bowel and the bladder together can't be underestimated. We know that at least 85% or more of our children are going, growing it through adulthood. So we really need to be working on incontinence. We do need to work on bowel ma management along with bladder management because we also know that poor bowel management negatively infect, affects bladder management. And um, we need to be cognizant that they have to have good, healthy bowel and bladder habits because we're looking at adults now, and Dr. Schultz probably could give you better information since he does the adults, but two-thirds of adults with spina bifida are not receiving regular urological care or bowel management. It's pretty concerning, especially if you're trying to get people to go and have a regular work and social life. So in a normal bowel, we have normal rectal sensation, adequate sphincter function, and peristalsis to move uh, the waste through our system. Impair neurogenic um, ba bowel, there's impairments in all these areas, and it leads often to chronic constipation and fecal incontinence. There's a very small portion of people that have hypermotility with spina bifida, but it's so rare, I'm not even going to spend much time on diarrhea. Other than that, usually when you see diarrhea, it's associated with constipation. So we want to be, I know I'm repeating myself, but it's like the, the, it's like the number one thing we encounter in clinic. We want to prevent or manage constipation. We want to get these children on a healthy diet. I don't know how many times children are eating chips and other kinds of food that will throw your bowel program out. They need adequate fluids, which is a huge problem in a child with um, oral motor problems associated with their Chiari malformation. We want to uh, get them clean because we want to prevent skin breakdown, and we want to um, get them uh, get their bowels go on a regular routine so they can be continent and not have accidents and not be teased. So, constipation we manage. The goal is to have the healthy healthy bowel moments, and I'll talk about that in a minute minute and again diet is so important sometimes we need to get nutrition involved with these families so early on we're dealing with medication with children mainly if, if they can breastfeed that's great it's the best laxative of all but um, uh, some children as early as a month or two old might need laxatives older children we may use laxatives or if we're trying to get them continent might switch to stimulants because you can, once you get the, but, but early on, if we can just get the stool soft and regular, that's half the battle because your rectum still has some preserved receptors in it. And if we, we um, can prevent that rectum from getting stretched out, we can preserve 
possibly some sensation or some function. Um, time toileting we try with all children, but most people will need some type of manual evacu evacuation. So, again, back to constipation. You can ask five different professionals and you'll get a different answer, and a lot more with mothers, but uh, the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology defines it as a delay or difficulty in defecation present for two or more weeks and sufficient to cause stress for a patient. So, for our purposes, that's not enough because it's more than a low defecation rate. I can have a child that can have a soft, normal bowel movement every two days and not be constipated. It needs to be, con to be constipated. Infrequent defecation should be along with stool masses, on rectal exam, abdominal pain, palpable abdominal masses, and large rectal diameters, which is the eventual outcome of poorly managed bowels. These kids don't have much tone in their rectum anyways, and if you're constantly stretching, um, then you're going to have more problems. I've seen a rectum a few centimeters inside, in size. Um, so I've learned that you can't ask people about constipation or even have them describe because they don't, everybody under reports constipation. And really what we're goal is to have a type 4 stool. This is the Bristol scale. And uh, <laughs> so it's, uh, our families, we do a lot of talk about pee and poop. And um, this is what we're aiming for. So if you have a history of a bunch of type 1 and you're, so the family says, oh, I go off the laxative because every time I go off of it, I end up getting diarrhea. Well, then you go back and they show you they're getting a type 1 stool or maybe even a type 2 or 3. What they're doing is getting overflow constipation instead of diarrhea. Um, so you go in, I don't like to do a lot of x-rays, but if you go in and do an, a, and somebody that doesn't believe it and you see a huge stool mass in that colon, the parents say, oh, and their child really is constipated. So we address this by doing a bowel clean out and then trying to start over. What's wrong with this picture, in the first picture? <laughs> exactly. Um, and she's not at all interested in doing it. This, the, and the therapist could, you guys could probably get me a better picture than this, but it's the only one I could find. So what we want to do is appropriate trunk support and um, foot support so they're not dangling. Uh, and that's the beginning to, to get them. When we, on the toilet, when we introduce time toileting, the th thing we really are trying to do is make them comfortable sitting on the toilet. So I'll just give them stickers for sitting on the toilet. You just, I don't care if they have results. Just sit on the toilet in a regular routine and that's half the battle and then we can move on. Time toileting though uh, doesn't work is, uh, for many people and uh, uh, then then uh, we go to digital stimulation, okay, so although some of the problems with suppositories is they aren't giving it appropriately. So you need to give this these in interventions on an empty rectum. You need to manually disimpact and then do your intervention. Um, as far as enemas, there's two types. There's retrograde and antegrade. So I'll talk about the retrograde are your typical fleets or any enema given through the rectum. Um, we try to do a mini enema. Fleets makes a little mini enema. Enemies um, is a mini enema. They're all different types uh, of mini enemas. And the idea is to give it and try to hold that uh, buttocks closed so there's enough time to absorb it and do its thing. But what we haven't, uh, we, we've have to go to a usually larger volume enema when these are ineffective. And that's where, you, have you all heard about the cone enema? Everybody wonders, what's the cone enema? And that's the one where, let me take a minute and pass it. So this is what they're talking about. What they used to make, I'll pass that, is a um, enema 
tubing that would pass through that cone and you could get higher up into the colon. But because uh, they stopped making that, uh, they, that's what we're left for. So it's not as effective as it used to be, but it's effective enough in that it plugs that open um, low tone rectum up to keep that fluid in. The little white uh, at, at the bottom of your screen is an enemies or a mini enema. And then you have your old typical fleets that, again, the problem with those is keeping the um, low tone rectum closed enough to get it effective. Uh, the antigrade rem enemas really is becoming the treatment of choice. And, the uh, surgeon, uh, usually the urologist, uh, will uh, re take a piece of the app uh, appendix. That's why it's called a continent appendicostomy, if you're lucky enough to have your appendix. Or um, use some uh, other tissue from the GI tract to create a channel to the abdominal wall. And basically, there's no appliance. People think, oh, a colostomy, but it's not. It's just a tiny little stoma in, uh, that exits the, the abdominal wall, and the individual gives their enema through there. And then there's something done through interventional radiology called a button cecostomy. And somebody else, I, sorry, I don't have the picture with me, but basically, something that looks similar to a gastrostomy button is um, placed in the abdomen, and that is where they get their, give their enema. So there are barriers to compliance, and really of all the interventions we get, you're, you have to have compliance if you're going to be effective. So executive functioning is a huge problem, especially as we, uh, we, there are a lot of kids we can get continent as toddlers in early school year, but everything falls apart in teenagers. And that's, a lot of this is this executive functioning, the planning, the organization, taking the time to do your bowel program. There's psychosocial issues. There are, I, I have concerns about delaying cathing in children that you're probably going to have to cath. I think the urologists feel like they're doing everybody a favor, but especially in boys, I try to introduce CIC in a boy that needs it. It's, in many boys, it's very, very frightening, and we really have to do a desensitization. There are 10-year-old boys that aren't cathing because they're so traumatized. Um, and they don't come, they usually come to us after they've been traumatized, so we have to go back and redo everything. Um, and remember that spina bifida is a changing condition. You had a good bowel program and then you developed tethered cord. It takes six months before that bladder gets back to where it was functioning, if it ever does, um, <clears throat> or your bowel management. So it's not a static condition. And then again, eye-hand coordination again, it can be a barrier. We really want to push continence because it in, incontinence in cre creates urinary tract infections. It promotes skin breakdown. It definitely impacts independence. Children aren't going to sleepovers. Uh, we, I actually had a child who was so excited that she went on her first sleepover, and none of her friends knew that when she went to the bathroom, she cath. She was able to go in underwear and her cath, cath equipment. Um, <clears throat> and then so it improves your participation in social activities if you can become continent. To summarize, spina bifida has been described as the most complex birth defect compatible with survival. Neurosurgical techniques have improved quality of life and morbidity and mortality. Therapeutic interventions are impacting functional outcomes. Neurogenic bowel and bladder are the associated complications that remain significant influence of quality of life throughout the lifespan. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. In the early on you said that um, kidneys are not usually affected by the lower lesion early of bifida. But then you talked about kidney ultrasounds and stones. I didn't make that clear. So, um, in the newborn, the 
spina bifida affects the lower tracts. That's where the nerves affect. It affects the bladder. Um, bladder, uh, bladder stones are a later problem. Bladder stones. Bladder and kidney stones are a later problem um, as a s secondary effect to the bladder problems. So, d is that on? Okay. Yeah. And are they more common in? In um, usually in after. Spina bifida than in the general population. They're more common in a person with spina bifida after they've had a bladder augment because the um, change in the bladder environment and the mucus mm -hmm. can um, contribute. Um, they also, poor cathing, if you're not cathing, you have a lot of urine residuals, you can develop bladder stones and the kidney stones can develop. Um, what, some other causes of kidney stones can be uh, just some metabolic changes in the older person like anybody else. So, um, does poor technique affect the development of stones because of the increased risk of infection? Sure. If, if well, rec poor technique can uh, be associated with uh, recurrent infections and also incomplete emptying of the bladder, that can lead to other problems. Okay. All right. Oh yes. How often do you recommend for adults that change their catheter? The, the companies are, uh, the FDA is only approved for single, for single use. use, right. Um, I thought Medicare changed though to up to, um, I thought they, five times, a uh, hundred and some catheters a month. Groups within Maryland Medicaid still do, I mean at least in the last year, still limit. Right, right. Our clients are definitely limited. Yeah, there, there's no good. Um, the problem is, is, is we can't. Uh, I think Hopkins likes them to change their catheter once a day. So when a um, physician is writing a prescription for MA, it's written thirty catheters per one month. Um, for the newborns, we'll do a new catheter. Um, for uh, honestly, I just write what the parents tell me now, <laughs> and, they, and then. Well, I'm working with a young adult that uh -huh. um, apparently hasn't been changing that frequently, and now to get her on that schedule has been. And well, that's because the previous right standard, there. when most people were saying you cath only, you change the catheter when you need it, but what we're doing, we're doing is at least once a day. Um, but I think for newborns, they get enough to do once every cathing. And they, uh, the, I haven't seen any recent research, but early on the research showed no difference in, the, in uh, urinary tract infection if you did not change your catheter because the mo most important thing was technique. Now I'm seeing more, or at least being told once a day by the urologist. Or in those children that have just repeated urinary tract infections and the family uh, just has tried everything and you feel pretty, you've gone, you've watched them cath and you think they have good technique, um, then we'll try the single use. And uh, the adults weren't getting many, but I thought the new Medicare rules allowed for single use or at least once a day. They're doing, they're reviewing the standard of care now, so there may be some changes. And you might be able to do it with a letter of medical needs. So yeah, I think mostly, I, I don't have any problems. If I really want a child to have a single use catheter, I honestly have never had somebody told me they couldn't. You mean and like I, the whole closed system? You mean that one? No, just a or regular just a catheter. catheter. Yeah. Um, uh, I have more trouble getting insurance to cover enemas, yes. <laughs> as you know. <laughs> but <laughs> so, okay. All right. Well, thank you.